Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're talking about how the TV streaming wars are having downstream effects on the magazine industry and how those effects are transforming narrative journalism. In 2020, Netflix is projected to spend $17 billion on content. Disney will spend $24 billion, and AT&T will shell out over $14 billion. With all that money on the line, there's an enormous amount of demand for new intellectual property that can be adapted into movies and TV shows, and a lot of that IP is being drawn directly from magazines. The Oscar-winning film Argo, for instance, is based on a 2007 Wired article, and the critically acclaimed Netflix miniseries Unbelievable is based on a long-form ProPublica article published in 2015. This rising demand means that Hollywood is throwing larger and larger sums of money at journalists just to option their articles. All that money has had a distorting effect on the entire magazine industry, with writers increasingly pitching more narrative articles in the hopes of luring a Hollywood agent. At least that's according to journalist James Pogue, who recently wrote a piece for The Baffler about what he sees as the negative impact of the streaming wars on magazine journalism. I recently interviewed Pogue about this phenomenon and why he thinks it's changing long-form reporting for the worse. Let's jump right into it. Hey, James. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Simon. Thanks for having me. Uh, So I brought you on to talk about an article that you wrote for this magazine called The Baffler uh, about magazine journalism in Hollywood. What's your specific background in magazine journalism? Uh, I actually, I mean, like a lot of writers of my generation, like sort of came up at exactly the moment when magazines as a force in American life were sort of like losing their way, I would say, Uh, which is to say, I um, never wanted to be a writer. I never had any concept of being a writer. Um, I was working in resources, like I was looking for gold in the Sahara. Uh, I dropped out of college and then I went back and... um, ended up like sort of by chance writing a memoir and that uh, one of my professors thought was pretty neat and he sent it to Harper's and long story short, they didn't end up publishing it because it was a memoir by a crazy 21 year old, but they <laughs> did give me an internship. Uh, and yeah. so I started at Harper's right at that moment when, you know, magazines were like, oh my God, what is the internet? Um, this was 2010, I would say. Yeah. You've written, you've gone on then to, to freelance mainly. Yeah, well, um, I, (laughs) I'm really reluctant to use that term freelancer, honestly, because I think it feeds into this sort of meta narrative of like, these hungry, grasping journalists who are always, you know, hustling against each other for assignments. And I mean, I suppose, uh, like, in a definitional sense, I am a freelancer. But it's one of the things that I think I wrote this piece in response to, which is like, people now are producing these major works of long reported nonfiction and they're not being sort of taken care of by magazines in the way they used to be. They're all sort of lumped into this big group of freelancers who are all doing web journalism and it's all sort of content. And I'm really resistant to that idea. Uh, With that said, I also have tended to have homes. So I followed one editor throughout most of my career. Uh, That was from... Uh, we interned together at the Oxford or at Harper's, and then he edited me at the Oxford American, then Vice, then Mother Jones, then Harper's, where I now still do most of my writing, it seems. Um, and other than that, I did a book, uh, which, truth be told, that's how you make money. I've never made a substantial amount of money for magazines. I paid rent doing that, but the reason I have money in the bank is because I was able to sell a book. Yeah, and you're one of those uh, writers who can do the long features for magazines. Like I've written for a number of magazines, and increasingly I'm finding a lot of these like web web pieces that I write for them. Like they're paying a couple hundred dollars a piece, and and I kind of actually wrote an article a few months mm-hmm. back about how how the the economics of this of like how much work it goes into actually just pitching them tons of articles mm-hmm. and how often editors just ghost you and how much effort like it, it really does not it, it, from an economic standpoint unless you're one of those mm-hmm. writers who can get on contract with you know the atlantic or uh the new yorker or the new york times magazine as like a staff writer or a contributing editor or something like that 
uh, it's it's really hard to cobble together just at least just uh, a, an, a living just from magazine pieces alone. You have to kind of expand into other things. Like you said, a book you said a book was your kind of avenue. Yeah, you know, I make a lot of my money through like content marketing and and consulting and stuff mm-hmm. like that on content strategy. Well, uh, let me say something hard that, to, actually because yeah. I I just want to push back on one point there. Uh, mm-hmm. you know when you talk about people who are on contract, like I actually just turned down a contract for this year. Um, and I won't think who it was with. It wasn't with the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, but it's a similar setup in that actually those contracts are a bit of a myth. You still have to pitch. You still have to get them approved. You still have to do this. And so I'm not going to name any particular names, but you know, I'm friends with a lot of New York Times Magazine contract writers or, or you know, people doing that. And they're not actually taken care of. They're not actually paid a salary. They're still pitching. They still have to get it past, I was about to name names, but they still have to get it past the senior editorship. So all that does is lock in a rate and it, and it locks into some degree like a formal association with the magazine, but those people aren't paying rent off the New York Times magazine contracts either. They're still doing books. They're yeah. still doing movie options. Like they're still doing whatever weird consulting, editing gigs that they can hustle up. Those people are not set. Um, and to be honest, I didn't know that. I asked this publication just now. I did a like a piece that really kind of took off and succeeded a lot for them. And I said, hey, give me a contract. They said, sure. They sent it over and I looked at it and I was like, wait, is this real? And they're like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is what our contracts are. And I was like, I just started, I was like, there's no fucking way, you know? Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on here. Yeah. Yeah. I had uh, Clive Thompson, who's a very successful magazine journalist on on the podcast a few months back, and he is a contract writer for New York Times Magazine. And he he did emphasize that point. He was like, when he, uh, he interrupted me. He's like, to be clear, a contract doesn't guarantee me anything. No. All it is is just, it's just locking in a rate for me. Uh, so, I mean, it's nice to have that association because it's easier for you to get into uh, that magazine. And there are exact, there are actual journalism contracts out there that exist where you're, you're on some kind of retainer and expected to turn in a certain number of pieces a month or something like that. But yes, like uh, some of those, some of those uh, contracts, those story contracts, really, you're right. It's just locking in a rate and kind of an official association. Uh, It's not a guarantee. And a lot of those are for legacy people, less people who are younger and coming up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the piece, the piece that you wrote for the Baffler, it's about how Hollywood is really hungry for intellectual property right now, and as a result of that, we're seeing more and more magazine articles getting options for film and TV. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Hollywood adaptations of books and stories—it's not exactly a new phenomenon, but now the rate of these adaptation deals is increasing. Why is that? Well, the biggest reason um, is the entry of streaming services into the marketplace, um, and A more philosophical way of looking at that is that there's a bigger shift in towards in terms of what Americans will do with their time and attention. And fundamentally speaking, Americans will spend huge portions of their time and attention staring at a laptop in bed, smoking weed or whatever they do. Um, They will watch tons and tons of television. And it turns out that that television, in my opinion, doesn't need to be that good Um, because it's easy to watch, it's easy to consume, it's easy to deliver, and it's easy to sort of pick out who's going to watch what based on an algorithm. And people do this all the time. And so in the last few years, with the entry particularly of Amazon and Netflix, but not solely them, uh, you have seen this massive boost in the market for, um, for what are called options, which is you know, if people get really confused about what an option is. An option is just somebody says, hey, I'm going to pay you anywhere from 1200 bucks to hundreds of thousands of dollars to have an option over, the, over a period of time to make something out of your IP, your intellectual property that I'm buying. It doesn't mean I'm making a movie out of it. Um, but what's insane right now is that the option market has heated up so much that whereas once upon a time, most options if indeed you even sold a magazine story for an option, would have been five grand or something, no big deal, it's nice, but it's not gonna change your life one way or the other. Those numbers are inching up to the degree that on the higher end, option sales are now approaching what you would get even to have a movie actually made. The number for the actual like 
end fee product and the auction is starting those numbers are starting to converge and that is absolutely new and it's the best indication of how overheated this market could be yeah so let me translate for listeners what you're kind mm-hmm. of saying so right now the stre- the streaming what so-called streaming wars are heating up netflix is is now posed poised to spend 17 billion dollars this year on content alone you know mm-hmm. Uh, services like Amazon, Disney Plus, Hulu, Peacock just got announced, Apple mm-hmm. TV Plus, uh, HBO Max. Like there's just such mm-hmm. a huge spending. You could even argue maybe it's a bubble uh, that mm-hmm. that won't sustain itself over the long term. But for for whatever reason, not only is Holly our traditional Hollywood uh, media companies spending a lot, but all these tech companies are getting in and throwing all mm-hmm. their tech money into it, and it's creating this huge rush of tens of billions of dollars that is being spent on uh, television and film content that mm-hmm. wasn't being spent before. Mm-hmm. And because there's just so much money there, what you're kind of arguing in the piece is that they're super hungry for IP. They can't stop. They're, they're just throwing money left and right. And as a result, they're, they're diving into magazines like The New Yorker, Wired, uh, New York Times Magazine, looking for narrative stories, any kind of narrative story uh, that could be converted into a movie. You know, one of the most famous examples is Argo, which started as a Wired uh, magazine piece. Netflix just put out a um, a show about a ProPublica multi uh, long investigative piece about right. a uh, a rape victim. Um, so you start the piece with this anecdote about how you're spending the night at a friend's house in LA. He's staying up late while waiting for a new David Grand piece Mm -hmm. to be published on the New Yorker's website. Uh, can you recount for us like that kind of whole, that scene of how it happened? Well, um, I mean the basic gist of that scene and like the, the point that I'm trying to make with it, which (laughs) thousands of people got really mad about was like, it was not to hate on David Grand. Um, I actually... I like David Grant. He's fine. I like it. Um, the, the thing that I'm trying to recount is that a David Grant story. Um, so I'm with a friend. He's a, he's a director of development, or he was at the time. Now he has a different job. Um, and he was waiting up for this story because what would seem like the ca- to the casual observer, like something slightly odd, a Hollywood executive anxiously waiting up for a magazine story in The New Yorker to drop has now become this massive event where now a David Grand story is almost certain when it's richly narrative and set out in a cinematic way, as most richly narrative magazine stories are now, uh, it suddenly becomes this kind of hot property that we can know for certain that someone's going to pay millions of dollars for. Um, and uh, so he's sort of, you know, beaten down in this a little bit, like, because he's sort of like, ah, they have so much power now, these agents and these people, who, these execs who like are turning all this stuff into movies. Um, and uh, David Grant, well, I'm going to say this wrong probably, but he, you know, his movie, The Lost City of Z, I think made quite a bit of money. Um, he's someone who is kind of at the higher echelon of these quote unquote content IP producers. Would he think? Of- yeah, especially since he does a lot of true crime type exactly. stuff, which obviously is perfect for kind of Hollywood adaptation. That is the main, you know, that is the, the fundamental form that like governs this moment is true crime. Um, and, you know, this piece in particular was a piece about a guy walking across Antarctica in the shoes of, um, of Shackleton. Uh, and, you know, it was by all accounts like a pretty good piece. Uh, I mean, my, my own included. Um, but it wasn't a piece that you think of as being a massive, important New Yorker story. It's not something that's breaking news. It's not something that has pretensions to great literary value. It's not by any measure brilliantly written. But all of that stuff has sort of gone out the window now. The stuff that matters now is the stuff that really fits this kind of narrative box. Um, And that's the thing that I was trying to get to at that anecdote, is that once upon a time, a really great reader, and this guy who I'm talking about in in the anecdote, is one of the best readers, in my opinion, in America. Once upon a time, a really great, well compensated, talented reader like that would be staying up looking for a, a, like a massive new voice in American fiction. They would be looking for deep literary insight. That increasingly is becoming rare. And uh, I mean, do you think like David Grant's agent was emailing everyone in Hollywood and saying, "Hey, the the piece is dropping tonight. Make sure to be refreshing." Like, how did people know in advance that this article was coming coming down the pipeline? The agent tipped a number of scouts, execs. 
uh, book, by, by scouts, I mean um, book scouts who are, this might be interesting to people who don't know. Um, there's a whole sub-economy of book scouts in Hollywood that are mostly people who grew up reading literary fiction, uh, mostly people who are refugees from either literary publishing or magazines, who now primarily like use those skills to just hunt down books. And they go to Frankfurt, the book fair, and they you know swap drafts with each other and they swap insider business and they're, they're all on Gchat together. And these are all my friends, don't get me wrong. Like, this is why I know this world particularly well, is these are some of the people I'm closest to in my life. Uh, but anyway, so, so like the agent would have tipped off the scouts. And once one scout has it, oftentimes in exchange for a bit of information, in exchange for another sneak, a scout will sneak a draft that they have. A scout will sneak like the date that something's dropping. Um, you know, and, and I enjoy this. I feed ske- sneaks of my own pieces to scouts sometimes, of course. Like, uh, not that they need it, because most of them were probably just reading, because I'm emailing my drafts to them anyway. Uh, but the point that I'm making is that the agent did this thing where she was like, hey, it's dropping. And there were enough people who were looking at the importance of this piece and thinking, ah, I better stay up tonight. And uh, so how, what triggered the you actually writing this piece for The Baffler? Like, obviously, you've been observing this phenomenon happening. When did you decide that you were going to turn this into an article? Uh, it had to do with, um, I was walking with a friend of mine, and we were talking about uh, the new Patrick Radden Keefe book, Say Nothing. Um, and I uh, am like very, very well acquainted with the main, one of the main characters in that book. Um, And the story, which I won't go into, but it's about Northern Ireland. It's about sort of ghosts of history. The story that Radden Keefe is telling in that book is something that I think is incredibly important. And to be honest, I just thought like, oh my God, why is this written as a true crime book? Why does this, why does everything we read sound exactly like everything else? And I said this to my friend and she kind of reacted in exactly the same way. And then I got an email from another friend about that book and he was like, dude, did you read this book? Because it's exactly what you told me about with this story, but it's just put in this format that it sounds like a fucking podcast. And I don't mean all podcasts are bad, but you know, that kind of Gimlet true crime podcast form. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, like, this is it. I I sort of snapped. I was like, you're right. And this book is going to win the Pulitzer, which it did. And I just thought someone has to say something about this because at least amongst my friends, it seemed like everyone I knew, knew that this was happening, knew that all of what I like to think of, like I write nonfiction that aspires to the status of art. Like, I I mean, I'm not trying to sound fancy. It's just, why else do it? Like, I'm trying to do important work. And you realize like, oh my God, like this whole industry is converging towards this, this sort of voiceless product production kind of industry. And I was just like, and everyone knows it. Why doesn't somebody say it? Um, and so I pitched the baffler. I, I mean, within an hour, they were like, you're right. We think this too. Like, here's a contract, like literally within an hour. Um, and so I, again, that kind of gave me hope, like, okay, maybe I'm not crazy here. Maybe this is really something people are interested in. And then of course, when the piece dropped, um, I, I mean, obviously I got exposed to it more than anyone, but the response was overwhelming. And uh, talk about a little bit about the economics of magazines mm-hmm. right now. Like, it, like this whole thing is happening while the industry itself is kind of contracting and on a decline. Like, so th- you seem to kind of suggest that um, there's like an economic thing at play. Not obviously they can get paid more money, but almost to the sense of like the magazine journalism is kind of like a loss leader so that they could use it as bait to get more money like that like it's almost subsidizing the actual writing of magazines well for for writing writing certainly i mean um i mean as regards there's a lot to that right there you know because like there uh, there's there's a certain level on which i actually do not think that hollywood is the sole progenitor of this problem i and, and i hope that nobody takes that away from this like um to the extent to which like I got mad at people responding to me, it was because that's what they seemed to be saying that I was saying. My belief is that this is a meta narrative of journalism that it has been very, very convenient to underpay writers, to develop structural forms that devalue the writer's place in a piece of writing, in a piece of journalism, um, and that offer 
magazines options to pay their writers less. And some of that has been because, again, because of you know, the, the industry contracting, especially with the great dry up of luxury revenue after 20, 2009. But many of these publications are profitable. Many of these publications are doing fine. Many of these publications are paying their editors, senior staff, publishers, advertisers, everything else, perfectly good, normal, well-paying, upper middle class salaries. They are not paying their writers that. And there's a reason for that. Um, and it has to do with the fact that like, they've realized that what they really want is not truly great writing, the kind of thing you would have to pay for and support. What they really, really need more than anything is shareable content. And that's not necessarily just something that can get turned into IP. Then what has happened is now as people get better and better, particularly I'm talking specifically about long form journalism, but as you get better as a long form journalist, you think, okay, well now I've done this for years. I've written for, you know, I'm speaking personally, but with the exception of Vanity Fair, there's not a major American magazine I don't have a byline at. But I'm still getting $2 a word, which sounds pretty nice, right? But if I'm working three, four, five months on a piece that runs at 5,000 words, two bucks a word, even that is good. That's better than I get at Harper's, which is my favorite magazine. Come away with anywhere between seven to $12,000. You can maybe do three, four of those a year. The most, like just on the base magazine rate, the most that I could possibly really make is like forty two, forty five thousand dollars $45,000 which is a magazine making a choice. They are saying that this product that they put out, that they put between their pages, is not worth the money that it would take to be a sustainable living human. And so the thing that I really object to is that, you know, you have these options. You have the option of making compromises and doing work in a formulaic way that can then be easily shared and optioned or you have to be rich. And I don't think either of those conditions should be a precondition for being an American nonfiction writer. And I remember reading a piece recently kind of doing the analysis of the of word rates and mm -hmm. like they really haven't come anywhere since like the 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 payment of like a dollar mm -hmm. a word in magazines like it, it started to emerge in like the 70s mm -hmm. or 80s mm -hmm. and now flash forward to 2020 and a lot of people would consider a dollar word to still oh, be absolutely. a pretty good rate. In fact, like, in fact, a lot of publications don't even pay that yeah. uh, now. So it's really like has not, it, there's been no kind of uh, accounting for inflation no. for, uh, for. I, I mean, I can, I can speak spe you know, specifically to that, which in the sense that like, um, you know, I, I'm a curmudgeon, right? So I, 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 I'm well aware of the fact that I write for magazines that are not paying the top, top echelon. And like that, is to a large degree like a kind of choice that I'm making. Like I don't pitch GQ, I don't pitch The New Yorker or whatever. But with that said, even Harper's, like, you know, Harper's was paying people two bucks a word in the 90s. Now they're not paying people two bucks a word, you know? And like, I mean, actually that's anecdotal, so I don't want to libel anyone, but I know for a fact that a, a good Harper's writer in the early 90s was making a fuck of work. Cause was, and this was people being edited by Lewis Lapp, Michael Pollitt, some of the best editors in the world. And they were getting this like major treatment in a major print magazine that people really cared about. And now it's kind of like, I still like the magazine, but you're doing work that people care less about and that you're getting paid fundamentally much less for. And you got to make something out of that. So that's why people are turning to Hollywood. And you argue, you argue in the piece that Hollywood, it's, it's like this whole dynamic is starting to warp what the magazines are actually publishing mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of the, like stories are becoming more and more narrative. What do you mean by that? Like what, how, like what's being lost or what, what are we seeing fewer stories of as a result of, of this dynamic? Um, a really good example that I'll give that I'm going to throw a bunch of shade on a bunch of people for is if you look um, and not that California Sunday, the magazine I'm about to cite as a good example, uh, not that they don't do this kind of narrative bullshit too, but California Sunday and the New York Times Magazine recently published basically simultaneous uh, pieces, reported pieces about the Paradise Fire um, in, in Butte County in California. Um, and I really encourage everyone to go read them side by side because the Cal Sunday one, um, is 
I, it, it's, I don't even, I don't even know how to describe it. It's very, very long but in compulsively readable. It delves so far into the history of Butte County. It delves so well into like the actual fire ecology. And this is obviously close to my heart, so I know a little bit about it, but it's like, it delves so well into fire ecology without getting lost in the weeds. It does such good work about how like capital has played into what happened in that particular fire. It's compulsively readable. It's really, really well written, it has a beautiful voice. And it got swamped in terms of attention by this piece in the New York Times that was basically like an action story about a guy driving a bulldozer, saving a couple families. And it's, I mean, it's a very viscerally rem- like memorable story in the sense of like, you have this character, he's a flawed man, drives a bulldozer, like pushing cars out of the way, saving lives. But the end of the piece, and again, I really encourage people to read the two side by side. The end of the piece is like, and you know what's crazy is fires like this are just going to keep happening. And that's a fundamentally, (laughs) fundamentally not true takeaway. But they didn't care. They didn't care because what they did, and I cannot you know, part of the deal with this Hollywood boom is you can never say when someone is deliberately trying to get optioned. We just know that it's always in the back of people's heads. But what we can say is we have a new sort of standard form, which is prioritized narrative over all things. And that's what the Times piece did. And it's the journalism that they did suffered for it. The piece is a bad piece. It has a bad takeaway. It is incorrect. And it does no public service. Versus the Cal Sunday piece that is not narrative, does an incredible public service. And what's the incentive on the magazine side to do this? Because like we understand, that based on what you're saying, is that the the writer can make decent money uh, from, from getting option. How does the magazine benefit? Well, and this is part of the reason that Hollywood's not the only culprit here, is magazines and the ecosystem that of American storytelling uh, are have to some degree conditioned readers and editors and writers to believe that richly narrative sort of voiceless David Granish pieces are the er type, the best version of what a magazine story can be. Um, And I mean, a lot of that has to do with people who frankly, like were involved with the creation of Argo, the people who wrote and edited Argo kind of managed to push this idea into the mainstream thinking of, of American magazine editing. Um, but some of it has to do with, um, you know, the, the, the websites, long reads and long form, uh, which do share some complicated weird essays. I, they, they, and obviously they've shared my pieces many, many times and I'm appreciative of that. Uh, but the kind of archetypical long reads, long form piece is something that, you know, is richly narrative, it prioritizes story, um, that has a hook that you can put online and say, hey, this is what this is about. And then people will be like, God, what a great story. Um, what you don't get now, and I think why like the California Sunday piece was a little hard to see online, was like, it's about what? It's hard to say. It's hard to say online with a little tag, like what this piece is saying, because it's saying too much. And in my opinion, we should celebrate that. But it's hard to put that in a movie. It's hard to put that in a little tag on Twitter. Uh, speaking of Argo, you talk about how the, there are some of these companies popping up to help facilitate mm-hmm. the magazine to Hollywood Hollywood pipeline. Uh, one of them is called Epic. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is a, Epic's approach and business model? <laughs> well, um, before I get sued for libel, I have to say that I don't know what their business model is <laughs> now that they've been bought by Vox. Uh, so, so mm-hmm. it, it, it could have changed um, quite substantially in, in recent times. Um, With that said, the basic epic business model as presented to the public was like, hey, um, we're going to we're going to take the logic of this moment to its absolute conclusion, which is like magazines aren't paying writers enough to do the work that this really takes to, to do. You know, I'm lucky right now to be here reporting the story that I'm talking to you from. You know, I'm getting paid to stay somewhere for a month and focus on something that's so, 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 so rare. And. Epic is like, hey, we will assign a piece. We will sell the rights. We will split the rights with you, the author, and us. And we will give you so much money from selling those rights because we know it's a good film. 
that you will then be able to take that money, work for 18 months, 24 months, however long it takes to make this the best piece it can be. It will go, we will publish it wherever it goes, and then someone will maybe make a movie out of it. Um, in general, this has to do, this meant that they would place pieces and then the actual movie rights would go to die because most things that sell in this overheated economy actually don't get made. Um, but Epic, at least now, has one project that is going and it is getting filmed. So clearly, like, this can work. It sounds very convoluted. Like, we're going to sell the story before you've written yep. it. Right. Yep. This is what mm -hmm. you're kind of saying. Then once we've sold the story, then yep. you can write it and then we'll go sell it to another. Well, no, they don't even sell it. They give it for right. absolute free. Like, so they'll give it to the New York Times magazine or something that like for, for free. Yeah. Cause they've already got their money. Like, it, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's possible that in some cases they may, there may be more money yeah. that changes hands, but the amount of money that would be changing hands in those cases, you know, for a 4,500 word piece, it's 9,000 bucks. It's probably not really a big part of Epic's business model, you know, versus like what they were, versus like when you have Apple Plus like filming a series, that $9,000. Yeah. yeah. It does seem like a very, it does feel, if, I, I remember when Vox uh, acquired Epic and it, it, it reading it then, it just seemed like a very convoluted business model. I wonder how well it's actually uh, working. Uh, how well, it's not. I mean, I, I now now I will get sued for libel. But, Don't worry, but you won't, no, you won't um, be sued I mean, for libel for anything you say here. Just slander. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, that's true, right? Um, but uh, <laughs> good point. Um, but no, I, with regard to that, they, my understanding, as told to me by the then editor in chief of of Epic, was that they don't actually make much of their profit, if any of it from the business model they put forward to the public. The way they make money is in the way that increasingly many people are making money in this horrible economy, where they are, um, they are using writers who otherwise might be magazine writers to get hired by brands. Um, and Ford, Google, other people have done this for Epic, where they will hire these writers, some of the best journalistic minds in America. I'm not kidding. And these guys will go out and look for stories that help to highlight the Ford brand, that help to highlight the Google brand. And then they'll do something like that. And so they'll write a story or produce a documentary or something like that that is extremely high-level branded content. And that's where you make the yeah. real money. And Epic is using, like many magazines do, Epic is using their quote unquote like journalistic arm as a loss leader into this other more lucrative branded content. How has all this affected your career in journalism in terms of the stories that you're pitching, stories you've had rejected, stuff like that? I would say that it has affected my career more as a as something that produces depression than it is that it is actually negatively like impacted me like it, it, in the sense that like there are many stories that i just like won't pitch or there's like days that i get up and work on nonfiction work and think nobody even publishes shit like this anymore and then kind of like don't do anything i've been lucky in the sense that like I am a curmudgeon and I have been able to continuously publish long pieces of nonfiction. Um, with that said, like, it's kind of just taken the joy out of it. I, I, and I, I know that that's a kind of a vague answer to your question, but I think it's something that a lot of people experience where on the one hand, I, I have a friend who um, I won't name, but he just sold a, a, a magazine piece for quite a bit of money, just the option. Um, and obviously he's happy about that, but when we sit around and talk about this stuff in private, you know, he's like, those pieces aren't like, n not that his pieces are not good, but he's like, you know, I'm playing a game. Like he, the, the joy of like doing a great piece of writing has to some degree been robbed from him because he knows he's playing this game. He knows that he's putting this stuff in these boxes. He knows that we all have to like live in this world. And his response has been, and absolutely fairly, his response has been to wade right into that world and do it extremely well. And, and you know, more power to him. I, have no, I don't criticize him for a second. My response to it has been to be like, I'm just going to write for Harper's and say fuck you to everyone else. Which means that I sort of like toil a little bit in like more obscurity than I would like. Is one of those options a better option than the other? I don't really know. Um, but 
it's obvious that I'm not the only person who thinks this way because God damn, like the number of emails I got after this piece dropped from people who have just been like, you know, I stopped caring about writing. Like a lot of people told me like, hey, I've stopped caring about writing five, six years ago because it just started to feel like a game. And that I think really does impact people's careers. It makes people do worse work. It makes people feel bad about themselves. It affects your mental health beyond forget the money it affects like how you view like why you're getting up in the morning you know um and i i think that that's really important for writers i think it's really important for writers to feel like they're actually doing meaningful stuff because in my opinion we are in my opinion like there wouldn't be this hollywood boom without us there wouldn't be all this good journalism out there there wouldn't be any of these magazines that have become roaring back roaring back since they're nadir you know, none of this would be happening without us. And to some degree, we're sort of viewed as these like little con like shuffling content producers, which drives me crazy. Well, we're seeing the rise of platforms that allow journalists to go to their audience and monetize them directly, like platforms like mm -hmm. Patreon, Substack. I was I was wondering mm -hmm. how familiar you are with these platforms and whether you think they might provide more journalists with a way to break out of the confines of traditional magazine journalism. Like, for instance, I don't know if you how, how much you've been following this thing with the California freelancer law, but it caused Fox to have to lay mm -hmm. off all these SB Nation sports writers and uh, mm -hmm. a group of ones that had written for this Golden States Warrior SB Nation blog. They just broke off and um, and basically launched a group sub stack that's going to be monetized through paid subscriptions. Seems to be going well so far uh, i mean d d what do you think of these kinds of platforms and whether they're gonna they're gonna kind of like break uh at least break writers back out of this this mold of the, this kind of magazine story that they're expected to pit yeah well i'd like to say one thing really quick which is just that as a california resident i'm a big supporter of that law and i think I, my understanding of the Vox thing is it is much more confusing than just they were forced to buy this law. I think they took advantage of it. And I think, I know that there are some problems with it, but I also think that a lot of people have been using that law to their advantage to be able to claim like, hey, look, like, anyway, that that's my only point about that. Uh, I agree 100% um, about those things. And I think quite frankly, podcasters have led the way in that regard. Um, I don't interact with a lot of writing through like directly, you know, self-monetized platforms, but I obviously listen to lots of podcasts and pay for them and enjoy them um, and mostly use Patreon to do it. Uh, I think, if I'm being honest, I think it's a little tough for me personally because I'm, the reason I came into magazines was because I'm not, a particularly public person. You know, I've got like, I don't know, I've got like 1,200 Twitter followers. You know what I mean? I don't really use Twitter. I don't, I'm not good at self promoting. Uh, I've always sort of wanted just to be able to let work speak for itself. And, you know, and, and there are people out there who are not like that. And, and that's great. You're saying that's you don't want to be a business person. You don't want to be a mark. You but don't want to be a market. I'm never going to be that person. Yeah. yeah. I'm never going to be that person. So if it comes to that, like I'm not going to have a career. Like I'm working magazines because magazines are what puts the thing on the shelf at the airport and then someone can buy it. Like that's to me, that's the point of having a magazine. And I think just on a philosophical level, like if being a writer, if what it takes to be a writer today is going to be like being the sort of modern equivalent of a zinester, like Xeroxing your things and handing them out. A lot of people who are really, really important voices are going to get lost in that um, because that's not quite always the job, you know? And so that's my concern there. Yeah, although I think it could, there's also off, opposite benefits that a lot of people who traditionally, who didn't fit in within the molds of traditional journalism will also uh, get wider exposure and Absolutely. careers and stuff. I have a, Absolutely. I have a friend, he's like a magazine journalist. He writes for like New York Magazine, The Atlantic. He has a book deal, um, mm -hmm. and, but he also has a sub stack and he just like publishes yeah. like once a week to it. And he has, I think he's making mm -hmm. like $1,500 a month from that, which gets comes out to about eighteen thousand dollars a year, which isn't enough to um, enough money to live on its own. But the way that he put it to me is like that's just a couple magazine stories. I don't have mm -hmm. to break my back over trying to sell. Like that's just like that extra mm -hmm. extra security that where you know that I have in my back pocket, so that it's getting me in, be getting me through the months in between successful 
uh, pitches to, for magazines or whatever like that. So, uh, and he's not putting like a ton of reporting work into it. It's like more like a column. Uh, I don't know. I think it, it, it definitely it changes the dynamic some, somewhat for p- these so-called, uh, I know you don't like this word, but freelancers who have to find mm-hmm. different ways to kind of bridge the gap in between the big tentpole magazine pieces. No, no, I absolutely agree with that. I was just saying that like, I think there's, there is a, a real concern in in sort of embracing those models where there is a, there are a lot of people who come into writing who are not good at self-promoting and who need that structure, who need that other thing of like the actual institutional support. And that institutional support has often been lent to like rich people, people who already had tons of advantages, people who already did internships, people who precisely don't need that institutional support. Um, But there is a reason also for those gatekeepers because the gatekeepers help people. And there, it's always going to be a conversation between those two things. But I agree with you 100% that that stuff's good. I just don't know how to do it. Okay, James. Well, those are all the questions I had for you. Where can people find more of your work online? Uh, well, I have a website that is James Henson Pogue. Uh, P-O-G-U-E is my last name, uh, .com. Uh, but if you just Google James Pogue, um, I'm there on the Twitter. Um, and yeah, you can see me. I have a piece coming out in Harper's, hopefully in... Uh, February. So um, that should be happening soon. It's about guns. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay. See you next week.